All right, so I'm back here on the bench and we're gonna be repairing a Alpine MRV 1507. I picked up this one for parts so I can, uh, you know, repair the boards and have something on the, on, on in stock to uh, work on other amplifiers that come in. And what I'll usually do is uh, on a parts amplifier like this, uh, cause I, I don't really use them. So I'll just strip them all down and, you know, repair the boards and, and uh, so, I get a lot of these amplifiers in and the main reason why I get a lot of these amplifiers in for and that doesn't exclude any other amplifier is because people don't know or don't understand how to hook these things up or they don't quite know when the amplifier is going into distortion. And that is a big problem with the amplifiers is if you run them past their specifications, uh, they will fail and they will fail fast. It may work for a little while, but it's going to bite you in the ass and it's going to let the magic smoke out. And with this particular amplifier here is people love to bridge these things down to two ohms. They will work, but you are at risk at blowing your amplifier. <clears throat> These things are specified to run at bridged no more, no less than four ohms and no less than two ohms per channel. So when it says two ohms per channel, when you bridge it, that gives you four ohms. So do not go lower than four ohms. Like I said, you can hook it up two ohms, but don't expect it to last because it will blow up on you eventually. And these things will put out the power. It will do it. I'm telling you, it will do it, and you will, you know, most likely get the power you're expecting out of it, but you're killing your amplifier. So that is why I see a lot of these on the bench, and there's probably a few other reasons why I see them on the bench, too, is number one is probably that. Number two is probably insufficient power supplying it. And, you know, and the other thing is, too, is people, the other thing that might cause an issue is people don't understand when... To turn it down is when it gets into your clipping and distortion range some people just don't care and they just keep pushing the envelope and try to get a little bit more out of it and it sounds like shit but it's loud that's when you're flat topping and you're pushing your amplifier to its limit that is another reason why they blow up <clears throat> and what happens sometimes is you'll you'll blow an output and then sometimes it will take the power supply with it if you're lucky it just takes a couple parts in the power supply or just a couple parts in the amplifier but it's um it's tough when these things run two ohms you're taxing your power supply and your amp section you'd be really lucky if your amp section survives and you'll be definitely your power supply is not going to handle it it's just going to crack out and these are notorious for blowing traces on the negative rail um negative input from the power supply on the circuit board it 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 just blows apart it just evaporates and disintegrates so whatever you want to call it it just disappears and you have to kind of when you when i'm repair, repairing them i just have to i have to rebridge them and it's just it's, it usually leaves a gap about maybe an eighth of an inch between the two traces it just snaps it like a fuse so these were very prone to it and every amplifier that i've seen that's been pushed too hard to pass its limits or had loose grounds or something like that has always taken that trace out and uh, when that typically happens, I end up losing the um, LED uh, IC. For some reason, it, it, every time I've seen that, that problem with that trace, it's always taken the LC, LC, uh, LED driver um, or logic chip and blown it, blown it apart. Not apart, but it blows it up to the point where it's not operating correctly. And you've probably seen me do that repair on the channel before. So I'm going to try and go through this amplifier and uh, show you what happens when you incorrectly hook it up or if you push it to, to its limits. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be here right now. It wouldn't be a parts amplifier. It would be a functioning amplifier if somebody actually read the manual and didn't, you know, go past its recommendation. So anyway, we're going to dig into this and uh, hope you guys can learn something. I'm going to try and... Uh, explain some of these circuits a bit as much as uh, I can um, I have the schematic here so I'm gonna just kind of lay out a few of the major parts of the circuits we're not gonna get nitty-gritty here but we're just gonna I'm gonna show you 
on this particular amplifier where the positive and negative rails are, how to test them, how to, how to, how to set up the bias on the outputs uh, once we get the amplifier functioning again, of course. So, um, yeah, so stay tuned and we'll, uh, you know, we'll do this up. All right, so now let's talk about the clipping portion. You got your zero, which is here. You got your positive 49 volt rail and you got your negative 49 volt rail. Now you're going to run this thing at 900 watts full tilt. Then you're going to get a sine wave that looks like this. A nice clean sine wave from 49 volt minus plus and minus 49 volt. It's going to look like that. It's going to sound beautiful. It's going to be loud. It's going to be great. You're running it at four ohms. Good. You're all set. Now, the second you take that signal and push it into distortion or clipping, you're doing this. Right? This is zero, yeah. And now what happens is your amp can't produce that. It just doesn't exist. You only have 49 volts plus 49 volts minus. So what happens? That happens. You turned your amplifier into a square wave generator. So now you have a wave that goes like this, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And these flat spots from here to here is basically keeping those MOSFETs on during that duration. Okay? And they don't like to be on for that duration. Depending on if you go lower in frequency, now you're talking, you know, these things stretch out. You know, so that you're talking the on time can be from this peak you know this from here to here so you are taxing the hell out of your MOSFETs just by going into clipping and distortion and if you're playing you know using this for a subwoofer amplifier so you've now just turned it into a, a fry later so um so yeah you now you got a signal that just kind of looks like this and you don't want that you know you want these to be rounded because you want to go up and down up and down you don't want this okay so just if it starts to sound like crap just turn it down it's not worth the power it's not worth it I mean it's you're gonna want it just sounds horrible and it's bad for your amplifier so just tweak it down if you're if your speakers can't handle it or if your amplifier can't handle it you just need more either a different amplifier or better speakers whatever because sometimes the speaker can actually cause this too if the speaker is only like 400 watts it will start um, it will actually cause the amplifier to clip so if your speaker is good enough to handle the wattage then it will you know it won't produce that problem but if your speaker starts farting and doing a lot of weird crap it's gonna backfeed and cause a signal that looks like this too so um, yeah alright so I guess we're just gonna dive into this amp now and just see what we can figure out for problems here all right, so now we're looking at the inside of this Alpine MRV 1507, and we're just going to take a quick look around to see if we see any damage and maybe explain the circuit a little bit. Uh, immediately, as soon as I opened it, I noticed that these power fits are smoked. They all have legs that are burnt off, and they are very obvious. So I can probably verify that these are all junk and need to be replaced there are six per side for each rail and again if you look at this amplifier as a um, if you try to split this in half you kind of can see the same circuit on both sides on this side everything seems to be okay but that doesn't mean it is I have to verify that with a multimeter but this is basically a DC to DC converter and what this does is half this amplifier produces your plus 49 volts and the other half produces your minus 49 volts. And there are two variable potentiometers right down here that adjust that very voltage on both sides. And there is a specification for that. And it is plus and minus 49 volts, um, give or take plus uh, 0.5 volts, plus or minus. So... That is the spec we're going to have to uh, adjust once we get this power supply functioning again. So once that this 
is turned on, the fan spins, and you get you know your voltage and everything. It's basically you have a bundle of cables that come over to here into this board, and this supplies this board with your plus and minus 49 volts and grounds and everything else. And in the very center of this amplifier is your plus and minus 15 volt section. And what that is for is for all your op amps and EQ and all that stuff. So what that's going to do is power all that and for uh, the rest of your signals to be processed that come in through the RCA jacks. So what we have is the power coming in going from 12 volts to plus and minus 49 volts and then back down to plus and minus 15 volts for the low voltage can, uh, stuff for the op amps. And on external to this is your pre-driver section on both sides. We're splitting this in half again. And it's going to be a mirror image pretty much. Not exact because you still have your a little bit of a difference here. You have a whole cutout for your adjustments and everything. But it's pretty much symmetrical. Um, these two transistors here, your, your plus and minus uh, regulation uh, for your 15 volts. There are two zeners hidden around these capacitors. One's right here, one's underneath the other. Those are notorious for shorting out. So you got to check those if you're having a problem with those two rails, the, the 15 volts. And what we got on the channel side is you got two, uh, I'm sorry, four N parts and four P parts uh, of FETs on each side of the amplifier. And same on the side and they've actually color coded these purple and blue uh, they are IRF 9540s and IRF 540Ns so those are your plus and minus parts and what that does is create the bottom swing for one half and the positive swing for the other half so that is basically you know your how it does it and these resistors are your drain resi uh, source resistors that combine basically these uh, two two FETs or all the FETs in that on that channel so they all can all combine to a same uh, output um, and take up a little bit of a discrepancy now your bias pots are right here and these are adjusted to uh, let's see uh, plus and minus uh, one millivolt plus and minus point six and how you do that is when you want to calibrate this thing, well, I shouldn't say calibrate, I should say bias it, is you will see two tabs, one here and one here. You're going to put your multimeter on millivolts and put your meter leads between these two, and you're going to adjust this to go to one millivolt. If it starts going higher, you're going the wrong way and immediately turn it back the other way. Because you can run this into a, a state that will start to short out parts. And it will just collapse and latch up these uh, FETs. I've seen that happen before. So, um, yeah, make sure you're going the right way. Um, so, that's, you got two on that side and you have two on this side. Um, and the same thing on this, you're going to put your millivolt. Um, your, your multimeter and millivolts and pull on here and adjust this uh, be very 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 careful with your meter leads if you slip off and you short one of these leads to that post or something to that effect you're going to kill something so I would suggest using alligator clips or you know a really steady hand to hold those leads there while you're adjusting that because um, more than once you're gonna find that sometimes you're just gonna kill things by tuning them <laughs> you're not going to do it intentionally you're going to slip with the probe and it's just going to be uh, a really big problem so that is it pretty much you know all these capacitors on each side they're just you know in the circuit to stiffen things up a bit um that's basically it uh that's how they work it's not really too complicated it's it just looks more overwhelming than it really is I mean, there's a lot of like you know coils and chokes and all sorts of crazy stuff but I mean, you don't really need to know all that stuff you just really need to know how to identify the sections of the amplifier and where the problem would be in that section 
Um, so, I, like, right now, we know we gotta start here. So we're gonna just pull these fets out and replace them, you know, and test surrounding components and make sure nothing else is burnt and, you know, give the board an inspection and make sure, um, you know, nothing else is wrong. And then if that's happened, we'll run this power supply up on a uh, li current limited power supply and we'll make sure uh, she's gonna put out plus and minus 49 volts. And if that's good, then, um, you know, we're gonna just move on to this and make sure there's no shorts on these because sometimes these will short out, causing the amplifier to fail, uh, the power supply to fail. So we're gonna verify that there are no shorts on the amplifier board before we hook this board back into this board. So that's it. Step one is pull these parts out, replace them, check for all the problems underneath, and um, power this board up separately from the amplifier. Make sure we get plus and 49, plus 49 and minus 49 volts, and then go from there. Then we know this part is done and complete and working. And if we find no other problems with this, then we're good. We'll just plug this back onto this board, fire it up, throw a signal at it, you know, current limit it, make sure it's working. And if it's working, then we're good again. So that's uh, it. So we're going to pull this board and see what we can do.